You're listening to Eyes on the Ground. I'm Slade Ham, comedian, writer, explorer. I'll be your host. I like disruptive personalities. Usually when we do something, we look at the way everybody else is doing it, and then we attempt to replicate that. Sure, we put our original flourishes on it all, but that's only in the creative process itself. What about how you present everything? Steve Hofstetter is a disruptive personality. You know Steve. If you have the internet, his Comedian Owns Heckler videos have popped up on your timeline at some point. He's the ginger kid with the glasses and sharp wit and well-honed improvisational skills. His YouTube channel boasts half a million subscribers, and he has over a quarter of a billion views on Facebook. It's easy to look at these videos on the surface and think that it's a gimmick. I'll tell you how easy it is to do. It's what I did when I first saw them. But that's the lazy answer, and the one some people grab because the alternative means doing a lot of diligent work. But that's the hideous truth. It's been a long, slow climb to hundreds of millions of views, and the ability to sell out venues outside of the normal comedy club model. By the time the first Comedian Owns Heckler video went super viral on Reddit, Steve had already published hundreds of videos of other content. He'd produced TV shows, written a book, and released six stand-up comedy albums. I want to find out how Steve Hofstetter manages all of this. But first, I want to talk about some of the misconceptions about those more viral clips. For instance, how real are these interactions? I mean, we'll, we'll get right into it. You know, I, I like people will say to me, they'll see a heckler video and then they'll see 10 more heckler videos and they'll be like, oh, you post those heckler videos. I'm like, that's less than 20% of my content, but you watched one. And when you watch one, Facebook goes, oh, that's what you watch. It's the same way that like, look, if you watch a show with a horse in it on Netflix and suddenly Netflix recommends a lot of horse shows to you, you're not dumb enough to go, Netflix only has horse shows. What is this? What is this? The horse network? All these horses on Netflix? Like, no, that's a fucking algorithm. That's how it works. That's how they make their money. Your, uh, your, your heckler video, and I, I only mm -hmm. want to start there. That is because what you just said is so key. It's a piece of what you do. And mm -hmm. I was part of that group of comedians who was like, God damn it, Steve Hofstad, what are you doing with this heckler? You're baiting these people. You're just the surface reaction. And that was me not knowing you. Just here's what I saw. And I hear that from a lot of comedians. And I have never been more wrong about a thing. Uh, Thank I, you. Because when I'm watching it, that heckler video coming out, in my brain, I'm like, oh, you must, that's, that's not a plant, but like, that must have been somewhat, you kind of had that planned, you kind of had, and then I start running that through my stand-up comedy filters where I'm like, that doesn't happen. My, my question is always, my question to people who think like that is always, okay, how? Tell me how, because let's just, for example, first of all, let's just assume I'm a good enough actor to pull that off, which I am not. Okay. I am, I've been in a couple of movies, check them out, I'm wooden, I'm terrible. <laughs> so... I'd have to not only be a good enough actor to pull it off, I'd also have to be a good enough writer to craft the whole thing. I would have to find an actor in all these different cities, including ones where I've performed at colleges where students speak up. So I'd have to plant this student or hire a student sitting with their friends, their friends don't know. And even if I was able to pull all of this shit off without any sort of evidence on the internet of casting notices or any of that, <laughs> you're telling me that in the age of social media and in the age of people wanting fame, you're not going to have one person come forward, you know, and also, by the way, the venue would have to be on it too. Which yeah, is of course, unlikely. seating them properly um, and not policing yeah, them. <laughs> so ridiculous. So here's basically what happened. Here's the evolution of it. So, um, years and years ago, I don't know if you know, Brian Bruner, mm -hmm. who's a, we did the Middle yes. East together. Yeah, so Bruner, Bruner and I were touring in Texas, actually, uh, at TCU. I remember exactly when this shit happened. And at, the, at that point, I had already filmed a couple of times and had a couple of clips that were on my YouTube. My basic philosophy was don't show your set until you're done with that material. Like, put the outtakes up. And so originally it was I, – I used to do this thing where I would ad lib every Sunday. So I would play a club. I hate – I hated the whole comedy club idea of like, hey, you know how you have two sold out shows Saturday? Well, instead of ending on that, we're going to have 30 people watching Sunday <laughs> and you're going to hate it. Isn't that a great way to say goodbye? Go home on a low note every time. Exactly. And so I started doing this thing where I asked the club owner's permission, but I started doing this thing where I said, 
you know, can I give out tickets to people who come to the other shows and tell them Sunday is going to be completely ad lib? And so that became a thing. And in some markets, it actually became more popular than the regular shows. That didn't nerve you at all going, hey, I'm going to go up and commit to doing these shows with no. There's that great Bill Hicks quote, the, you know, your act is what you fall Fall back back on. on. So anyway, way, way off topic. See, we're in the weeds even on this. This (laughs) This is what we do. Two ad lib guys together. This is what happens. (laughs) So. Uh, so anyway, I'd been posting those clips and then uh, Bruner and I were in, you know, we're at TCU and he had a flip camera. And I had at that point, you know, I was a couple of years in, into being a comic, but I, I would record when the club had a camera, mm-hmm. when there happened to be a video guy get there, et cetera. But watching how easy it was with this stupid flip camera with these things at that point where, you know, they had what, like 40 minutes of battery. <laughs> in, in, and if it wasn't at the first table, you just looked like moving mashed potatoes. <laughs> like it was horrible. And, but at the same time, I saw the ease of it and the, in, and how inexpensive it was. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to get one of those. And I started recording and pretty quickly, there was something that happened that changed my career, which was, uh, I was in Utah and they, for some reason they promoted the show on Brigham Young's campus and the first five minutes of the show, a third of the crowd walked out because I said the word shit. Oh, God. And it was, but the two thirds that stayed gave me a standing O. And it was one of these, and I put I put up, you know, the, the clips of what was going on. And for the first time, people on, you know, and I had some people on my Facebook, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have much reach. But everybody's reply was pretty much the same, which was, we like that you're not afraid to say what you believe. And that started changing my entire approach to comedy. It's when I, it's when I started going with the brand comedy without apology. Right. And which is a brand I've used ever since. And it's, it's something that, you know, my belief isn't that, Oh, apologizing is beneath me. My belief is think about what you're going to say first, then you don't need to apologize. What's the goal. What is it you're actually after? Is it a fan base you can count on for ticket or album sales? Do you want to be able to fill venues in various markets? Maybe. You're trying to pivot from a part-time job to full-time artist. Wired editor Kevin Kelly wrote an essay called A Thousand True Fans well over a decade ago. The premise is that any artist can make a successful living if they could just gain a thousand real fans. Fans who would buy anything, to the tune of about $100 a year. It's a more surgical approach, relying less on winning over everybody a little bit and more on really winning over a smaller audience. I asked Steve about some of the ways he manages his fan base and about his approach to cultivating a stand-up career that has essentially bypassed the comedy clubs. Like, I I tried all these different ways to, like, quote-unquote, game the system. You know, all these ways of being creative when it comes to promotion. It's one thing I often say is that our job is to be creative and original on stage. And the second we take our feet off that stage, we are the biggest hacks. Yeah. Comedians are such fucking hacks when it comes to promotion where they're like, oh, I need to do material no one's ever thought of before, but I'm going to do the exact same fucking thing everyone's done for generations to promote and <laughs> never think about things differently. That's that's the part of it that's so intriguing about you and some other people out there that are doing this. Your sort of business model seems a much more likely to succeed model than the the pray for a TV show sort of attitude people have right now. You've kind of built a place where you're not necessarily walking into the chuckle hut on just a Friday night and taking whatever they throw you. You're kind of building Actually I don't. Not at all. I, I don't. I'm I'm at the point now where it's funny because when I started drawing, I was like, okay, good. I could finally get the weeks at clubs that I wanted. And they weren't really paying attention to me. And I was like, well, fuck, all right, I'll keep doing this bar thing. And so I would do these bars and stuff like that. And then it would slowly, and then I started doing off nights at clubs. And now I don't want a weekend at a club. I, I turn down weekends at clubs. And the reason why is A, it's way more lucrative. I could make what they'll pay me a weekend at a club, I can make in one day at a rock venue right. and then leave in one show. Right. I don't need to do six shows at your damn club. But also, I'm tired. Of and look, there are some good clubs, and I'll still I'll still do the off night thing, but for the most part, I don't want a club owner to lie to me about how they lost money <laughs> when I sold two hundred <laughs> tickets on a fucking Monday. I don't want to I don't want to deal with the whole like you know someone's drunk and belligerent, so they apologize to him and give him free tickets to a future show. 
Mm-hmm. I don't want to deal with all of that garbage anymore. I, I don't want to deal with someone being annoyed. I, I was at one club. We sold out a Monday. No exaggeration. Sold out a Monday to the point where, by the way, we had a cut off sales three days before the show. I, on a Monday where they're usually, this is a Thursday through Saturday right. club. They're dark or an open, yeah, nothing. Yep, and you know you know what happened? The manager was so annoyed he had to go into work. And <laughs> us like we were interrupting his, you know, who dares disturb my thousand year slumber? I'm tired of that shit. And what I do now is, you know, I'm, I'm thankful, I'm, I'm making the jump now to small theaters. So I'll do like, you know, usually like a 400 seater, um, but even when I'm not, even when I'm doing like, you know, a, a music venue that seats 100, 150 people, I walk in, I have complete say over the place. I give them the money it costs to rent it. I walk away with a check. Everybody's happy. So wait, what is your, what does Steve Hofstetter's workflow look like? I've heard a million <laughs> times because I'm curious how much of this you do and how much of this you sort of have a team and have farmed out and figured out all these clever technological ways. But you got a college show day and you're probably going to pick up footage that night. What does your day look like? Well, I, it's very different now than it was two years ago because, because now I have a staff, like now I have an editor. Um, but even with the editor, I still do, uh, what's called the string out, which is basically like, I take, uh, you know, like, let's say there's an hour show and there's five minutes I want to use. I'll do the edit points of like, Hey, these are the five minutes that you should use. And then the editor will, you know, make it nice and do the cuts and all that stuff. Um, I trust her and she's great. Um, so she used to work, uh, at the laugh factory. I used to be the EVP of film and TV at the laugh factory. Mm-hmm. And she was one of the editors there. Okay. So, so it's not, it's not somebody left, on Fiverr. That's uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is someone who works for me full time. Gotcha. Now, originally the way that it would work before I had staff or anything, what would happen is every week or two, sometimes at the end of the tour, sometimes once in the middle, whatever it is, I basically, so I do, I do a show after the show, I go back to the hotel and I import the video. Um, that just takes a little bit of setting up. It's five minutes or so after the video imports, it takes about 45 minutes. I have to render everything. And that's so it's small enough clips in order to actually edit it. Um, rendering has to be overnight. It takes way too long. So I try to make sure to do that before I go to sleep. And then I set it to render does overnight. I wake up, everything's fine. It's ready to be looked at. Um, every now and then there's a fucking technical problem and I have to, oh, yeah. you know, set it up to re-render and then go get breakfast, come uh-huh. back. Uh, once that footage is, is, you know, rendered and ready to edit, I basically import all of the shows into one timeline and then I go through and what I'll usually do is I'll watch a show on, I found the fastest I could watch and still understand what I'm saying is 2.3 speed. Ah, and that's... so I'll watch it faster so 45 minute show will take me 20 minutes to watch. I should speed yeah. listen to me. That's so simple. <laughs> no, you, yeah, you do it 2.3 when I'm doing it with, cause now I have the other comics do Q and a with me. And on that, the fastest I can usually go is like 1.6. Cause I don't always know what they're saying. I know what I'm right. saying. You have a little bit of recall from the night before, but exactly. And so, um, and not only that, but I just, you know, I know, I know my voice better. <laughs> and so, right. Uh, um, I so I'll play it on you know fast speed. I'll chop it down to the things that I like, and as I'm doing that, I then you know move it into its own clip and put it you know and and put it regular speed and go okay this is exactly what I want blah blah blah. Here's the title of the clip. Um, and what I used to do, I would then edit them. And in the last couple of years, like caption them also, because captioning videos is super important now. Mm. There's a lot of people watching their phones with the sound off or the first couple seconds of it is off. And once they see that it's something they like, they go, okay, that's, you know, cause the default might be the sound off when you're scrolling through your feed. Of course. So, and I would do all of that and it would be a fucking nightmare, but I would do all of it and, you know, and post it and et cetera. Now at the point where I have everything ready to go, I then send it off to an editor who will do, who will choose the angles, who will get it captioned. Um, like I have a caption guy who, which by the way, secret for anyone listening, rev.com, rev.com. It's a transcription service. It'll be about 90% accurate. And then you got to go in and fix the little things, but it'll save you a ton of time. Um, oh, and then I also have to record, I, I record a bunch of intros and outros all at once. So I'll do a batch of like five or even 20 videos at once where, you know, I'll sit here in my studio where I am. 
Um, mm-hmm. Or if I'm on the road too long, maybe in a hotel in front of a fucking curtain. Right. Um, and, you know, and I'll just record all the intros, do the outros. That's super important. A lot of people don't do that. What I learned when I was hosting laughs is that you're not talking to the audience. You're talking to a person. There is a person watching the show. And so whether you're doing television or whether you're doing web or whatever it is, you're talking to a person. It's never like, thanks, guys. It's always like, thank you. And letting the person feel seen. And when I realized that that was, I mean, I'd been doing it for a little while on that theory, but when I realized that like, there's no way that's wrong, right. was I was performing in Amsterdam for the first time at uh, Boom Chicago. Now, Boom Chicago has two showrooms. There's a 100 and a 300 seater. I was doing the 100 seater and we sold it out, but I was talking to the guy uh, who was running it and he goes, hey, we've had people perform in the 300 seater that sold it out in four minutes. I've never seen a crowd more excited to meet someone at a show. Household names, celebrities, et cetera, but I'm their buddy because I talk to them. And I don't just talk to them on the video. I also interact on social media. And, you know, I'm I'm reachable, I'm accessible, and, you know, there's never this, like, oh, I'm too, I'm too big for you, I can't, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, like, look, if someone sends me a forward, I'll be like, hey, that's not really my thing, please don't do that, you know? Right. But if someone sends me a nice message, the least I could say is thank you. That's and it. it adds up to people feeling like they're part of what you do. The other theory that I have with this is controversy drives um like controversy drives engagement but i don't court controversy i go the other way around if there are people being assholes i ban them i ban so quickly nice. and the reason why is because i want 90 to 95 i mean look at the thumbs up ratios on my videos it's insane mm-hmm. and the reason for that is because i have created a culture of be kind to each other And so if someone's being a dick, even if it's not to me, if it's to each other, sometimes I'll step in and be like, hey, guys, that's not what this is. Um, Or I'll just ban someone who's being an asshole. And so now my fans know that also. And it's not that they're afraid of being banned. It's that they'll step in. Right. And so, yeah, you've got two choices. You can let controversy drive the algorithm or you can create a place that people like hanging out. Does that – but does that – I guess this is my own concern. Does the the constant sort of living – not living in that – um, realm of being around fans and interacting with them and sort of, you know, if, especially if you're building a bit of a culture and not that that ever reaches a cult level, but doesn't, pl- does playing in that pool at all, uh, change the stuff you try to put out? Does it make you go, Oh, let me cater to these people instead of doing what I want to do or art wise? Not at all. I've, I've never even had that thought. Like my, my thought has always been, I mean, if anything, sometimes they do, I let them check me a little bit because if there's something that like, I don't understand and and I speak on a subject too quickly. And look, I try not to do that. You know, someone once said to me, do you always have to be right? I'm like, why would you speak if you don't think you are? <laughs> um, but the, for me, it's, I, I have a huge belief that you find your audience, whatever you believe in, someone disagrees with you. It, so if you are someone who says, oh, I love a sunny day. Someone else likes the rain. I'm a dog person. Someone else tells me to fuck off. They like their cat. And I don't, I cannot concern myself with those people. And so all I can do is put art out that I believe in, um, you know, stick to my truth, learn when you make a mistake, but be consistent because if you're consistent, then the people who like you, like you. And whenever anybody says something to me about like, like I'll put up a video that they don't like, and they'll be like, oh, I used to be a fan. My response is you were never a fan. There is certainly something cliche about getting up and chopping wood each morning, or carrying the buckets down to the river, or whatever other parable you want to use to convey the importance of doing the work every single day. There's no guarantee that any of this leads to a specific result, of course. But step one in choosing to pursue any art form is to find something that you love doing regardless of the reception. You have to enjoy the process, and what that does is allow you to begin to build a body of work. And we're able to make that body of work better once we begin to delegate some of the less artistic portions of the businesses that would become. It took me, I butted heads with my manager so much because of how many things I would just handle without talking to him. He was like, that's not how you do it now. I need to be apprised of everything. But I I spent 14 years doing all this shit myself. For me, it's always a matter of what 
what do I need someone to do that I can't do just because I don't mind the work. I really don't mind putting in the hours. If this is, why am I going to give somebody 15% if I could do an extra three hours a day and keep 15%? That's, that's been simple math. It, but at, yeah, at the same time, like I can tell you that you're a better artist when you don't have to worry about this other shit. There are people who will talk about like, you know, uh, so Louis, when, you know, before we knew what we knew, um, when he was putting out a new hour every year and people were like, oh, he's so prolific. Mm -hmm. And I look at that and I go, what would your life be like if you never had to make a business phone call? What would your life be like if you never had to pitch anything? If you could just write, if when you had an idea for a 15 minute bit, you could go run that bit 10 times in one night and people would be happy to have you there. Like how quickly would you develop an hour? I, I do a new hour about every two years or so. And, you know, now I've slowed it a little bit because I'm trying to like get a little, it used to be, I would record an album when I had an hour of jokes. And now I'm like, no, no, no. I'm trying to, I'm trying to weave a story here. The amount of times I've listened to a great comedian and they say like an album and they say goodnight after the end of it. And I'm like, wait, there? Did yeah, you, yeah, yeah. What? <laughs> that makes no sense. And I started changing that when I, I was in uh, England. Um, God, this had to be, you know, almost 10 years ago at this point. Um, the first time I went over and I went over right before the uh, Edinburgh, Fringe. right before Edinburgh. And so I saw everybody doing their preview sets and I'm watching people do an hour that made sense and that had a story. And I just went, fuck. I, the, that's what stand up is. That sort of one man show. It was uh, I, the one. It was John Leguizamo's freak that stuck with me long before it kind of hung with me well into once I started stand up all through. It still needles at me and goes, man, this is even though that's not stand up, it's what you should mm-hmm. be striving for. That's what a cohesive thing should look like to me. Yeah, but but Berbiglia, you know, I like know but. Yeah, like it's we we see it in the states. It's not as common, but we see it. And like, I don't think like look, people who do fringe every year write a new hour, and it's like, and you know, thirty minutes of that is usually really good. And some of, of it course. is like, well, you got to test that a little more. But but the idea of making a point of of coming out changed. Like we do. Imagine if a movie was just like two hours of good scenes. <laughs> right, what the fuck right. would that be? <laughs> <laughs> right it would be it would be fantasia <laughs> it would be. yeah exactly it's <laughs> like well here's the car chase yeah. <laughs> and here's the you know it would make no sense not and at all so yeah now broadway does that sometimes when they put a bunch of songs together with no fucking plot but like <laughs> the 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 idea that we can we can have a through line and so it takes a little longer the i was a better comic in 2008 than i was in 2010 because i started playing these strip mall clubs and i started being concerned about getting booked and i started and, and so I started, you know what, I would have an offhand comment about Walmart and it would get a big laugh. And then I'm like, Oh, let me write my Walmart bit. Yeah, no. And it would, and it's, I started doing stuff. I started doing jokes that other comedians could do. And, and to me, like, yep. that is not an act. That is a series of jokes, but here, here's what made me understand it. I was doing a college and the student activities director had checked the fuck out. He had a new job that was coming up. It was his last two weeks. He did not care. He didn't promote the show. You know, it's, it's you know, 10 to 20 people in a gymnasium. The stage is a fucking table that Just, collapsed uh... as we started. Like, <laughs> we weren't lit. Some of my merch got stolen. It was like every bad thing. And you know what happened? I bombed for 45 fucking minutes. And you know what I bombed with? Material I wasn't proud of. Wow. That sucked wow. and that's when i realized that like there are some situations where they're not going to listen to you no matter what the fuck they do you may as well talk about something <laughs> you're proud of that's another bill hicks thing where he said if you're going to bomb talk about something interesting and it's true and so and and shortly after that i did i had an audition at danger fields and i really wanted to get past the danger fields it was important to me and and i had there was this five minute bit that was like my easy, it was stuff about being a redhead, very self-deprecating. It, you know, people would laugh at it. Always, And work. then there was other stuff that was darker that I was, it was the newer stuff that I was more proud of. And it's a little more hit and miss, but I said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm doing that stuff. And on that night it hit and I was really fucking happy. And like <sighs> that evolution just kind of showed me that like, 
you have to, there, there was a phrase that Phil Palisol used about me when I was featuring for him in like 2005, maybe where he said, he goes, you drop the comedy plow. And I appreciate that. And I've, I, I, I have strayed from that sometimes, but I try to remember that. Wow. And I try to remember the idea of like, drop the fucking plow and I will take, no one drives two hours to see someone they kind of enjoy. <laughs> and how many times have you left a comedy club and someone go, oh, you know what? We saw this guy who was so funny. Oh, he's my favorite comic. What's his name? I don't, I don't remember his name. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, make a fucking impression. I would so much rather half the room hate me and half the room love me than the entire room kind of like me. That's uh, that's why I get heckled. The- <laughs> <laughs> if there is one theme that recurs on this podcast more than any other, I think it's the importance of creating a body of work independent of the audience. It means making things that are authentically you regardless of the audience's wants. But it also means making things that are authentically you, regardless of the audience's existence. You have to fall in love with the act of finishing things. Period. You have to accept what they've become and release them into the wild like one of those magicians who takes a lion back to Africa. How can you drum this simple fact into a young artist's head? You can't. I, so, a decade ago is when I started, like, really getting into Reddit. Mm -hmm. and Reddit is why I can sell tickets because, I mean, look, there's a lot of things that added up, but the, the video that went super viral and changed everything for me, right. That was some kid in England posted it, you know, overnight to us, posted it on Reddit where I had already been active. I already had a bit of a base and it went viral. And then the next day I knew how to use Reddit. So I did an AMA and then that went viral and it was just this snowball down the hill. But like before that all happened, Stand-up shots is this huge stand-up shots is basically an open mic to 400,000 people. And I emailed hundreds of comedians that I've worked with over the years. And I said, Hey, most of the people posting here are amateur garbage. If you can post good jokes on still images, just make your own little memes and post them to stand-up shots. It's as if you are doing an open mic to hundreds of thousands of people. And you're the only pro on it. So do that. And I can't tell, first of all, most of, most of them ignored the email. A couple of people said, yeah, that sounds great. And then never did it. And then a couple of people started posting to it and then got two or three shitty pieces of feedback or one thing didn't go viral. And they were like, well, okay, you know, the, I don't like this. And it's like, you know what? When you perform to a crowd, how many people in that crowd actually like you? When you're killing what are you getting? 70%? Right. Yeah. 80%? Yeah. It's never all of them. Absolutely. And and what do we do as comics? Sometimes we focus on the one guy in the front. It's hard not like to. Right. <laughs> or, and which by the way, how many times have you focused on that guy and then that guy came up to you after a show and said something super complimentary? Dude. And he it turned was, out that's just his demeanor. That's it. He's just not a big out loud laugher. That's a, I only right. recognize that. That's a, why are you acting weird? He's not acting weird. He's acting like himself. I just noticed. Exactly. So what do you fucking care about some 12 year old with too much time in his hands, pretending to be an adult talking shit to you? What do you care when the ego comes out of it? Cause I, dude, I was right there, Mm -hmm. man. Uh, uh, An unsubscribe from the mailing list. A, uh, you see a number drop all of a sudden Instagram follower disappear. You see all of that and it would be one and it would drive me nuts. And now there's a part where you just go, okay, as long as more people are coming in than leave, I've got to be okay with the relationship being temporary. Absolutely. And the, and, and that person could have unsubscribed because they canceled their entire account or cause they, you know, or, or cause they died. Like you have to get yourself in the mindset of who cares. Like someone sent me a message, uh, the other day. And I, I only reply to this stuff to screenshot it to other people uh-huh. because just the idea of like, okay, I'm going to lose a follower. Well, I'm going to gain 20 because of this. And so someone sent me a message and all it said was, uh, you probably don't care about one less follower. And I wrote back and I just replied, fewer. (laughs) Strong. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Would you be where you are right now if if that video of the heckler had gone viral and you didn't have all the other content up before that? So that's, a, that's actually a wonderful point. It's something that I talk about. So amazingly enough, that went viral. 
not only did I have a ton. Okay, so do you remember that woman who had the gorilla mask on and she was like giggling like crazy? The Chewbacca, the Chewbacca mask. mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Chewbacca yeah. mask, yeah. So is she famous? No, because that's the only thing that happened. Now, look, 80 million people saw that, but then what? Right. So when my when that first video went viral, um, and at the time, I already had 95,000 subscribers, which is you know nothing to, nothing to sneeze at. But that video brought me 45,000 new ones in three days. Jeez. But the reason is because people see it and they go, oh, this clip is funny. The, the video I put up before was a self-funded comedy special. Was, it was Ginger Kid, which I, I you know, crowdsourced some of it. Like I basically sold copies ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I paid for the rest. And I, you know, shoestring that shit together. And let's be honest, I should have spent more money on it. <laughs> but it was something where it's like, oh, did you like that? Well, not only do you have 400 other videos, but I also have a special that you can see for free. And I also have these other albums and I have, you know, et cetera. So you're 100% right. And it's a point I've made a number of times of the idea of like, yes, yeah, something hit, but... I had all this other stuff. It's that, you know, my overnight success was how many years in the making. Right, 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 um, right, right. And what I like to do is I like to I like to post pictures of my YouTube graphs to people who, oh man, I've been doing this for three months. Nothing's happening. And I'll show that red line for nine fucking years. And nine <laughs> years in, you see a little of that. Mm -hmm. And then 14 years in, you see that. That's and like and, and how long do you stick with something? I don't know. It depends on if you're having a good time with it. The, some of the best advice I ever got in comedy was Jimmy Brogan. Mm -hmm. So Brogan, aside from being a brilliant comic, speaking of ad lib guys, um, he also booked The Tonight Show for five years. And so I am about six years in, and I'm watching comics who, who I wouldn't allow open for me getting television spots. And I'm, I'm losing my damn mind. Mm-hmm. And I called him up because I go, hey, man, you know everything about booking a late night set. What am I doing wrong? And he goes, well, are you making enough money that you can eat? You OK? I said, yeah. And he goes, are you having fun? I said, yeah. And he goes, then shut up and have fun. <laughs> Six months later, I booked my first late night spot. Wow. And it was a change of perspective. And how long do you stick with something? Is it fun? I have done a bunch of different podcasts where I, I do podcasts like British people do television. I do like a season and then I stop doing it. Which is right. And, yeah. And part of that is because, yeah, you know, it didn't catch the way I wanted it to. And, and I have I have other stuff that I enjoy more. Well, and, and so doing, I do the other stuff. Doing Committing to a weekly or biweekly or however frequently you're doing a podcast, committing to that is a – this is all I'm recording these interviews. This is going to go up as a yeah. podcast series. It will be a season. It will be 10 episodes or so. And I will put it down and go work on something else. That that's a, that's a, that's a commitment. And it's a question of whether or not you enjoy it. You know, there are people who have been doing podcasts every week. Look, there, there are guys like Theo Vaughn who, you know, Theo and I started, you know, not together, but pretty same similar class. at the same time and, and hung a lot when, you know, when we were both doing nothing <laughs> and watching him now be a fucking celebrity is amazing. And it's because he was doing something that hit, but he enjoyed it and it was his voice. And that's why it, because he's not trying to be anything he's not. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned that that conversation was pivotal and six months later, what, what changed in your head? What did you do differently once that epiphany sort of happened like what, what how did the next six months go differently i mean i was writing for me and i was performing for me and I, I i was having fun and like the reminder of we do an amazing thing have fun with it is important and like i'll tell you when the booker came to see me i did my set it was it was at the laugh factory and i performed and i had one of the best sets i had had up to that point in my career and i walked off stage and a buddy of mine was there and i just looked at him and i go well if i didn't get it tonight i'm never gonna get it just so, like yeah, exactly. Like either I got it or I didn't. And every time I talk to someone who is successful in some endeavor or another, there's a, it's like a patience with intensity. There's no rush. 
but there's also no idleness in the process. It's a very uh, cool. I'm good with all this. This is this is going to be what it's going to be. I'm doing it so it turns into something, but that's not the only reason. Yeah, if I try to I try to liken it to dating a lot. Like if your if your one goal was to marry a specific person who wasn't interested in you, what chance would you have? <laughs> But if instead you just became a better, more attractive, more interesting person, you'd have a much better chance. So take this disruptive mindset with you. Poke around in the spaces in between what other people in your community are doing. When everyone else was presenting themselves to the usual oversaturated social media platforms, Steve took to Reddit. Choosing to let go of the standard club model put Steve in a position to not just make more money, but to alleviate a host of other problems that exist in the way we usually produce comedy shows. I walked away from the conversation with new ideas about how to interact with my own fans, a reminder that I have to do the work, and a bolstered confidence in making more noise about the things I believe in. Links to all things Steve are available at stevehofstetter.com. Also consider taking in a virtual comedy show on Steve's latest platform, The Nowhere Comedy Club. Visit them at NowhereComedyClub.com. Eyes on the Ground is produced by me, Slade Ham. Additional production and music provided by Brian Carrion. To support future projects like this, please consider contributing to my Patreon or subscribing to me on all things social media at Slade Ham. S-L-A-D-E-H-A-M.